series and this time is the second Riddick movie Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, this came out four years after Pitch Black and uh, when it was announced I was like well that's kind of cool I really like Pitch Black but I wasn't quite sure what they were gonna do with it and I, I was pleasantly surprised it was an extremely large budget movie which had some problems in and of its own it, it forced them to a PG-13 rating so they had to neuter a lot of stuff and tame a lot down. And then even talks about that in uh, some of the featurettes on the Riddick Blu-ray. And, and I tend to agree with that. There's, the PG-13 rating is ridiculous. Our entire rating system is ridiculous. I don't think it should exist. If you can't tell from a trailer if a kid should watch a movie, there's something wrong with you. But, you know... It, when you get on to PG-13, especially in 2004, it was still they were still pretty strict on the ratings. You know, you're, you're losing so much violence and so much blood. Now, again, the Blu-ray, of course, is the unrated director's cut, so you get some of that back in. But, you know, it controls how they're filming it, too, and a lot of the scenes they're writing into it. So, this one starts five years after what happened in Pitch Black, and... You got all the same characters recurring that, that survived, which I thought was cool. Uh, I love when they keep the continuity. And the same actors, except for uh, Jack, of course. They're, they changed Jack. Um, but they this is where we get an idea of who is Riddick. Where, where did he come from? What's his point? And then this huge mythology is introduced through Judy Dench's elemental character of... You know, he, he's this prophesized guy from a race of Furia that were all wiped out by the Necromongers, and it makes it feel very big, but also cohesive. Um, I know a lot of times you'll see something, if you look at like a, a Star Wars, although Lucas was involved in all six movies, and it is a very huge universe, and especially if you take the expanded universe, it, it becomes unmanageable, but it's more like, it's not very cohesive. It's kind of like a bunch of different universes mashed together, unlike a Star Trek who has a board that approves everything, so it, again, it feels very cohesive. It feels like one world, not a bunch of different worlds mashed together. And, you know, this all being done by Tui, uh, along with Vin, it keeps it very linear. You understand the world we're in and what's going on. Um, Carl, Carl Urban is one of the Necromonger generals in this, and he's always great. Poor guy. He ends up in a lot of movies that necessarily bomb when he stars in them, which is kind of sad, but he's fantastic. Um, I, I like what they did with uh, the character Jack, having her try to be like Riddick, and end up you know, in some prison and finding out she can't get the cool eyes that he mentioned from the first movie. And that's, you know, that's a nice little ties back to the first film without making you have to have seen the first film recently, you know, to, to remember, oh, wait, what the hell are they talking about? They don't have that. Um, Keith David's character's back, and we get a little depth into him. And, you know, he's, he's always cool. But you understand more uh, about him and what he was doing in the first movie. So it fleshes out the characters from the first one. Now, this is not as personal of a movie as the first one because, again, it, it's huge. I mean, there, there's huge army scenes, gigantic, you know, taking over a planet, and it's just big. I, I, a lot of money went into this. I'm pretty sure it's Tui's largest budget film. And... It didn't have quite the success they expected at the box office, so, you know, it obviously the budget went down for, for Riddick. And again, they complained about having studio interference, which is, is a big problem if you have an actual vision and the studio is telling you, no, 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 we need to get more, you know, more in this age group on this bar chart to make more money, change your script. I, I can see that because that's going to be a problem. So it seems like... From all the interviews they did, neither one of them wanted to put up with that again, and that's 
So for here on out, we're not going to probably see this kind of a budget movie, but again, it gives them more creative freedom. So what I like about this one is it's a dark sci-fi movie. I mean, it's it's almost like Mad Max in space kind of feeling. It's not, nothing is pretty, nothing is clean, everything is kind of down, except Riddick, you know, who doesn't buy into any of the bullshit. He goes off to, you know, he, he doesn't even, and he doesn't really want to, he kind of is a selfish asshole, but he cares for people. So when he finds out that Jack is in trouble, basically because of him, then he goes after her and he con you know, the whole movie was him trying to, f well, the whole first act was him trying to find her, then the second act is him in the prison, them trying to get off that world, which is Bleed's second, third act, and then eventually fighting the Necromongers. Now, this is where we're introduced to the Necromongers' way of life, the you keep what you kill, and their whole going into the under underverse, which is kind of like, I guess, an afterlife of some sort. We don't know what that is yet, um, but hopefully in a future movie we'll actually find out. And, you know, this, this is the ending of the movie was kind of sad. I mean, what happens with Jack, and then the final shot of, of Vin on the throne, it was, it really set the tone. This guy just became emperor of all these people, and he just looks so solemn and depressed and lost. And, but again, at that point, too, you, you're like, okay, where are they going to go with this movie next? I mean, you gotta, you just kept building and building and building. It's going to be freaking huge. You know, so I, but it really leaves you hanging. So uh, as an individual movie, I kind of knock it down a little bit. As the second installment in what we have of three now, it raises it a little bit. Because we see what's going on, we see what happens, and you get the follow-up. Um, so I, I would give uh, Chronicles of Riddick a uh, probably a 7.5 out of 10 as well. I kind of like it more than the first one, but again, they're so different films. This is your big, like, summer action movie version of Riddick, whereas Pitch Black is your indie, private budget version of Riddick. And I think, obviously, with Riddick, they combined those two elements very well and created an even better movie. But this gives us the, the universe and the world. So this is a good sci-fi movie where, again, it doesn't conform to the norms of a lot of sci-fi at all, especially modern sci-fi. This is a, a manly man kicking ass in space and just being a badass in general. And I like that. It, it makes it feel a little different than what you're used to in almost all the sci-fi that we get nowadays. So definitely, you know, again, check this out. Great movie. Too is a great director. Uh, the Blu-ray, all kinds of crap. Unrated version, of course, a lot better. Uh, commentary, everything. This is a Great release. If you want the movie, this is the version to get. Um, and the packaging is nothing special. So, I'm not sure what else they could have included. So, I'll give this one a uh, nice 9 out of 10 on the release. Um, so, check it out. That's Chronicles of Riddick. Check out more of our uh, installments on the David Tui series. And like and share the video. And we'll see you here next time at Movie Mayhem.